Welcome back everyone. Today we're finally looking at Chomsky hierarchy. But first, I'll recap. So last time we saw that CFG are defined by the four tuplets which contains non-terminals, terminals, production rules, and the starting symbol. And production rules have the non-terminal on the left and a string of symbols which can be terminals and non-terminals on the right. We also saw that the semantics of a CFG is that a sentence is in the language defined by a CFG only if it can be obtained by derivation by using the production rules of the grammar. And so we had an example of derivation here, but basically what we do is that we start by the starting symbol and at each step we replace one non-terminal, it does not matter which one, by its right hand side or one of its right hand side. So with that, I give you Chomsky hierarchy. So this guy here is Chomsky. He's a famous linguist and he's also famous for his political opinions. But we're language nerds, so we don't care about politics. So how do these grammars differ from context-free grammars? And first of all, you already know regular grammars, because those are the grammars that underpin regular expressions. Context-free grammars, of course, and context-sensitive grammars unrestricted grammars. So of course, context-sensitive grammar, non-terminal, string of symbol. Regular grammars are sort of similar, but there can only be a single non-terminal at the end. And this non-terminal is basically used to implement repetition and optionality. So if this string is empty, then you have an optional non-terminal. And if you use right recursion, so if the non-terminal on the left is the same as the non-terminal on the right, then you express repetition. For type 1 grammars, you can see that on the left, we no longer just have the non-terminal, we also have alpha and beta, and these things are a string of symbols. And you see that we only replace n though, so alpha and beta are present on the left and on the right. So they represent the context, which stay fixed while we do a replacement. For type 0 grammars, we can basically rewrite anything into anything. So, like I said, at the non-terminal at the end of the production rules in regular grammars is used to express repetition and optionality. So what can't regular expression express that CFG can express? Well, a very simple example is nesting. So for instance, the language of recursively nested parentheses, and I've, I've written the CFG here, is very simple. Note that this is also a valid peg, so this is not a palindrome language, so the peg for it is perfectly valid. What about type 0 and type 1 grammars? Pretty much, they're useless. I don't know any use for them, either in computer science or in uh, linguistics. However, the concept of concept sensitivity, that's very useful. And I will give you just one example using the C programming language. So imagine you have this in C, which is a function call with a single parameter is this the multiplication of x by t? Or is this an access to pointer x casted to type t? And the interpretation of that will depend on whether t has been defined as a type or as an identifier. So that's the context. However, CSG, so context sensitive grammars, they're a bad way to encode this kind of constraints. So in practice, nobody uses them. Otten has support for context sensitivity uh, and is documented. However, I don't recommend that you use it. And I don't think you need to use it. In general, it's a good idea to push complexity out of the parser and to do some post-processing. Basically, your own code where you handle data is going to be better than parsing because parsing, first of all, it does not give great errors. And second of all, it's harder to debug. So, one reason I think this Chomsky hierarchy is very cool is that every type of grammar is mapped to a type of automaton. And it's the simplest automaton that you can use to actually parse the grammar. So what's an automaton? Well, an automaton is the formalization of an abstract machine. And I'm pretty sure you all know at least one automaton, and it's this one, the Turing machine. So a Turing machine is an abstract machine that can compute everything that is computable. Okay, it's a universal machine. So let's take it from the bottom. For a context-sensitive grammar, the automaton is a linear-bounded automaton, 
which is a Turing machine with a finite tape. So maybe you'll remember if you had a calculability class that a Turing machine has this infinite tape on which you can write data. Well, this is the same thing, but the tape is finite. It can be as big as you want, but you have to set a limit on the size of the tape beforehand. In practice, these two things are fairly similar. They are restrictions, but for most cases, it doesn't really matter. What will be more interesting to us is those two kinds of automaton. A deterministic finite automaton is this thing on the right. So it's a very simple automaton where we transition from state to state by consuming a character in the input string. Okay? And it's always an ambiguous. So if you're in this state, you can either see B and you go there, or A and you go there. For context view grammar, it's a non-deterministic pushdown automaton. So it's the same thing as, as this, with two differences. The first difference is that now you have a stack data structure and transition, so this is a transition. Transition can push on the stack on the, or they can look at the stack to make a decision. The second difference is this is non-deterministic. Well, this was deterministic. So what does it mean? Uh, a non-deterministic automaton can have multiple transition with the same symbol. So you see here, we have only a single A transition, but a non-deterministic automaton could have a second A transition. And that's it already for this video. So next time I will give you some more precision about lexical analysis.